Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian. It's good to have you with us on the second Sunday of Advent. A few announcements for this morning. Many of you have been greeted and helped by the warm and smiling face at our front desk over the past year. That's Ellen Braun, who sits behind the front desk and helps many of us with our projects and other work. This coming week is Ellen's final week with us as she is moving on to another opportunity. We'll really miss Ellen and everything that she has done in ministry here, all the things that she has helped us with. And we ask that you would take some time, if you see Ellen this week, to thank her for all that she has done to help us in the ministry here at First Presbyterian. Next Sunday, we will be having our Christmas concert here at 4 p.m. in the sanctuary. And everyone is invited to come, invite your friends to join you. Our choirs have worked very hard on preparing this music, and it's a wonderful way for us to be together in fellowship and worship God together. Coming on January 7th, it is the beginning of our Wednesday evening programs. We will be having Wednesdays at first starting in January. This will start with our kids in kindergarten with a re to fifth grade with a revamped 411 program. Middle schoolers will have lots of fellowship opportunities and adults will have all new classes that they can participate in along with um, some fate formation. We um, have actually are in the process of securing someone to come and do the yoga and meditation and other classes. So there's a wide variety of classes for you to take and to participate in beginning in January. And again, dinner will be part of this new programming for Wednesdays at first. Our last announcement is our South Dakota Mission Winter Coat Drive. Our South Dakota Mission team is asking for help for the children who, of the Sisseton, South Dakota this winter. Please donate your gently used children's coats and other winter gear in our collection boxes in the narthex or near the chapel entrance. Temperatures in Sisseton can reach 30 degrees below zero. So thank you for supporting these children who are part of our ministry each summer in a mission trip there. Now let us worship God with our call to worship. Please join me. We give thanks for the light of Christ shining in the lives of all God's people. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. We light these candles as a sign of our waiting and hope for the coming of Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Advent wreath, with its symbolism, aids our understanding of the significance of this season. As each year we prepare our hearts for renewed welcome to the Christ child's birth in Bethlehem. The second candle is the Bethlehem candle. It reminds us of the dark night when Joseph and Mary found light and warmth in the stable. Just a moment. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of King David. Joseph went there because he was a descendant of David. He went to register with Mary, who was promised to marriage in marriage to him. He was she was pregnant and when they she was pregnant, and while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have her baby. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to have room in our hearts and in our homes for others who need us. We thank you for friends and strangers who have received us when we were lonely, or tired, or afraid. May we be ready to receive the love God offers us in Jesus. 
we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. time for the kids to come forward for the children's sermon. All right, come on down. All right. Great. Love to see so many kids here. It's great. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? Good. Well, last Sunday we talked about a special season that we are now in. It starts with letter A. Anyone tell me what it is? Yes. Advent, that's right. Can you remind us what Advent is? Yes. We're waiting for Jesus' birth, that's right. Anybody else? Yes, you in pink? Did you want to share something? It's you in the pink coat right there. That's okay. You can still raise your hand if you want. That's fine. Uh, ben? We're waiting for Jesus' birthday. That's right. Different ways of understanding Advent. One of the things that I like about Advent is that we see signs of God and signs of hope every day. And while we were waiting, I thought it would be fun if I brought a little present that I want somebody to open for us that's going to teach us about Advent. Always lots of volunteers to open the present. Yes. Katie? And it's a small package, so when you see what it is, I want you to share what it is with everybody. Lots of paper, I know. 
It's a candle, that's right. So what does a candle do? Yes. Yes, you right here. Mm -hmm. It brings light, that's right. Anybody else? Yes, uh, yes. Every week until Christmas, you light a candle, that's right. You just saw that a few minutes ago, didn't you? That's great. Ben? Remind you of Advent, that's right. Candles bring light, and they help us to see more clearly. Have you ever been in a storm and, like, the power went out, and that was really scary? But then you had candles, right? Candles are really great. And candles, actually, candle is a good symbol of hope. Did you know that? You did? All right. (laughs) Smart kids, you knew that. Um, We talk about having light in the darkness, and that's one way we like to talk about God. And we like to think that we're people who have hope as children of God. And can anybody tell me what hope is? What is hope? Ben? Hope brings Advent. Well, there is definitely hope in Advent. Anybody else? Hope. It's a small word, but it means a lot. Yes, you in the pink? You want to share? Oh, she said, when you light candles on a birthday cake, it's about making a wish. So you have hope for something you want that year, right? That's a good example. Well, I th- when I think about hope, I think about things that I want to happen, good things that I hope happen for my friends and family, and maybe having the world be a better place. So this morning, when we're on Mountaintop together, we're going to talk about things that we are hoping for, and they could be small things or big things. But I want us to hear from some of the adults things that you all are hoping for. So if you could just call them out. What are you hoping for? Peace. Time with family. Bold speakers. Good health. Well-being of your son. All right. These are all really good things to hope for. And even just like this candle is small here, there's no hope that's too small. As long as you have a little hope, that's all you really need. And so today, I thought I could have one of you volunteer to read this scripture passage as a prayer for us as we go. And when you read it, I want you to read that top part too, okay? Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Thank you. Amen. So since we already said the Lord's Prayer together, we're going to dismiss by grade, starting with fifth grade, and fourth grade, third grade, second grade, first grade, and kindergarten. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on us. There is no shadow that can conceal our sin from you, and no secret that you will not bring to light. Therefore, knowing that God is all-knowing and compassionate, let us pray together. God of night and day, there is no shadow that can conceal our sin from you, and no secret that you will not bring to light for our revealing and wayward ways. For our debauchery and licentiousness. For our quarreling and jealousy. our sins. Renew us in love. Teach us to live in a way that brings honor and glory to your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
The peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. The first scripture lesson for today is from the book of Genesis. Listen for the word of God to you. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that were wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Galilee, and the camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. When Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Medanite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of Lord. Our second scripture reading today comes from Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. So to begin this morning... On. Is that a little bit better? There we go. All right. May 17th, 1966. We're on the same page? Okay. I want to tell you a story about one of the most pivotal moments in rock and roll history. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. We're going to go back to Manchester, England, where Bob Dylan was playing a concert at the Free Trade Hall. Now, during the first set of his concert. Dylan played the songs for which he had become famous. He played songs like It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, Just Like a Woman, and Mr. Tambourine Man. And during that first set, every song that he played was a solo that he used an acoustic guitar. But then during the second set, he he left and he comes back and he has this band with him called the Hawks. And he starts playing all his music using an electric guitar. Dylan had begun experimenting with electric instruments in 1965, and he had started to distance himself a little bit from his folk roots. Now, the audience who was there to watch him play, they loved his folk music. But they weren't so happy about him playing with an electric guitar. In fact, they began to turn on him during that second set. They believed that by playing rock music, He was betraying the very people who had made him famous. Now, as this second set wore on, the crowd became more and more agitated with Dylan. After every song, the crowd would sit in silence and then clap slowly and defiantly to show them how much they disagreed with what he was doing. And then, right before the last song of the second set, as the band was getting prepared to play Like a Rolling Stone, a man in the audience named Keith Butler yelled a single word at Dylan. Judas is what he called him. Now Dylan, who was indignant at the insult, replied to him, I don't believe you. You're a liar. 
Now this moment, it was spoken about throughout the entire world of music because this moment was so critical. Because it was the moment that rock was transformed into an entirely new era of music. Dylan used this moment to transform rock into a more artful form of musical expression. Now, what I want to focus on is the insult that Keith Butler uses to describe Dylan. Judas. Why does he call him Judas? Well, I think many of you are aware that Judas is the character in the New Testament who was responsible for betraying Jesus. Judas was one of Jesus' inner circle, one of the people who Jesus relied upon to spread his ministry. But then, at a certain point, somewhere along the way, Judas became frustrated with Jesus, turned his back on him, and was willing to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. Now, that term, selling out, you all have heard it before? Yes? Okay, it comes from this story. And it means that you have invested your life in a particular cause, and then you're willing to turn your back on that cause for money. Now, Dylan, at this concert, when he started playing rock music, everybody in that audience believed that he was playing rock because he wanted to make money. They believed that he was willing to abandon his folk roots to become wealthy. And so that name, Judas, it's synonymous with rejecting your beliefs and turning your back on your ideals. And this morning, I want to talk about the historical roots of this kind of betrayal and why it is so closely associated with Jesus of Nazareth. We all on the same page? We know where we're going this morning? Okay, so to begin, I want to talk a little bit about the sermon series that we're going to be doing during Advent. Now, you heard Adrian get up here and talk about Advent, but let me just lay it out for anybody who may not know what Advent is. So, Advent is a season in the Christian calendar. Now, our normal year for generally everybody around the world begins what day? January? Right, first. In the Christian calendar, that's not when it begins. It actually begins during Advent, because that's the time where we prepare for Jesus' birth. And during Advent... We're going to stop our sermon series on the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to do a sermon series called Jesus As. And I think it's really important that as we anticipate Jesus being born on December 25th, that we contemplate how Jesus represents the culmination of so many different characters from the Old Testament. Now, last week you heard Adrienne get up here, and she talked about Jesus as, does anybody remember Jesus as? Moses. Okay, so Jesus is Moses, and basically what she talked about was Moses, he gives the law to the Israelites on Mount Sinai, and Jesus, he gives the law to Christians during the Sermon on the Mount. And the basic message that she came away with that morning was both Moses and Jesus, they help us follow God's will. So today, we're talking about Jesus as Joseph. Now, if you were here during my sermon series last year where we were talking about Genesis, I actually made this comparison then. And so I just want to give you really briefly a little insight into what I said at that time. What I said was, is that both Jesus and Joseph, they suffer so that people can be saved. So in Joseph's story, what happens is, he ends up being sold into slavery by his brothers, and then he ends up rising to power in Egypt so that he can store up grain during the years of plenty, allowing the Egyptians and his family not to die during the years of famine. So he suffers for a time so that other people can be saved. Jesus, similarly, he ends up going to Jerusalem and being crucified on the cross. So he suffers for a time so that humanity can be saved. Now, that's not what we're focusing on today so much, but I just wanted to put that out there so you know about it. You can go watch that sermon online if you really want to know what I'm talking about and you don't know what I'm talking about. Today, we are looking at another similarity. And this similarity is between when Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers and Jesus being sold out to the authorities by Judas. Now, in order to understand the comparison between these two, 
I need to get into some of the details of Joseph's story. Because if you don't understand the details, the similarities aren't going to make sense. So, Joseph, he is one of 12 brothers. That number 12 is very, very important in the Bible. It comes up over and over again. And every time you see it, it's referring to the 12 brothers or the 12 sons of Jacob. These 12 men, they become the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. So let's recap. You got Jacob. What's his other name in the Bible? Do you all know? Israel. Okay, so you have Jacob. His name is also Israel. He has 12 sons. Those 12 sons become the father of the 12 tribes. This is important because when the Israelites escape from Egypt, Adrian referenced how there's a movie about to come out about that, right? And, you know, Christian Bale, he's playing Moses because that's what Moses looked like, right, was Christian Bale. (laughs) He's a good-looking guy. When he's coming out of Egypt, they settle in the Holy Land, and the way they divide up the Holy Land, they carve it up according to those 12 tribes. So anytime you see that number 12, what it's referring to is the beginnings of the nation of Israel. You follow me? We're on the same page on that one. Now, how many disciples does Jesus have? Do you all know? Twelve. This is not a coincidence. The Gospel authors want you to be thinking of the beginnings of Israel because in the same way that Jesus begins His new movement with twelve disciples, They want you to think of how God began the old movement with the 12 brothers. Now, whether or not Jesus actually had 12 disciples, that's actually a matter of scholarly debate. And we're actually going to get into that in our sermon series on Mark when we return to it. But for now, let's assume he had 12 disciples, because this is going to make things a lot easier for this particular sermon. So we have 12 brothers, 12 disciples. We on the same page? Okay. Let's go back to Joseph's story for a minute. Now, in Joseph's story, his brothers are angry at him because he is the most cherished of all of their father's sons. Jacob, he just lavishes gifts on Joseph. And it's clear that he favors him over everyone else. Now, it's important for you to understand that the brothers, they don't actually like this very much, but they're willing to put up with it, right? But what pushes them over the edge is when Joseph, he has a series of dreams where he makes it very clear that one day he is going to be ruling over his brothers and his father. That is the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back and they're like, you know what? We've got to get rid of this guy. We're done with him. So that's when they conspire to kill him. One day, Joseph, he's walking out into a field and the brothers, they're like, all right, this is our chance. We can take care of him now. But right before he gets there, Reuben, one of Joseph's brothers, and the name of a very tasty sandwich, I might add, (laughs) he convinces his brothers not to kill him. So they end up throwing him in a pit, and they're sitting there having lunch, actually, which I think is funny, while he's in this pit. And these Ishmaelite traders, they come by, and Judah... Another one of Joseph's brothers says, hey, let's sell him to these Ishmaelite traders. And so they do so, and they end up receiving 20 pieces of silver in return. Now, Judah sells Joseph into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. In the New Testament, the man who is responsible for selling Jesus to the authorities, his name is Judas. Now, the Old Testament was written in what language? Hebrew. The New Testament was written in what language? Greek. We have two different languages. Interestingly, if you take the Hebrew name Judah and you translate it into Greek, it comes out as Judas. Again, the authors want you to be making a comparison between the circumstances that lead to Joseph's suffering and the circumstances that lead to Jesus' suffering. So the next question we have to ask is, what were those circumstances? Well, I think everybody in here knows why Judah sells Joseph into slavery. Joseph, he makes a prediction about the future that Judah doesn't particularly like. And so he's like, you know what? I'm going to get rid of my brother. But why does Judas sell out Jesus? That's a much more challenging question. 
Because in the New Testament, if you read closely, all they tell you is, is that Judas was evil and greedy. But that's not really the reason why. If you look in Mark, for instance, right before Judas sells Jesus out to the authorities, Jesus actually makes a prediction about the future. He talks about the temple being taken to the ground, which is something we talked about a few weeks ago. And he discusses how those people who follow Jesus, these people are going to undergo a great deal of suffering. And apparently for Judas, he doesn't really like this very much. And so this sets into motion the events that result in Jesus' death. Now, for me, the motif, the theme that starts to emerge from all this is that betrayal occurs when two people disagree about where the future is going. And I think this is a truism in our lives. Have you ever noticed how when a leader talks about the future, that tends to be when people turn against that leader? Abraham Lincoln, he talked about a future where slaves were free to pursue their own lives. And what happened to him? He was killed. Martin Luther King Jr., he talked about a future where we lived in a society free of racial prejudice. And what happened to him? He was killed. Why does predicting the future result in betrayal? Because if the future you see and the future I see are two very different things, then I want to ensure that the future that you see does not come about by eliminating the person who predicted it. In Joseph's story, he predicts a future where he's going to rule over his brothers. And so, what does Judah do? He wants to get rid of the possibility of that future, so he gets rid of his brother. In the same way, Jesus, he predicts a future where his followers are going to suffer. And Judas, he doesn't want to suffer. So what does he do? He gets rid of of Jesus. And the irony of this is that in all of these instances, whether it's Joseph, Jesus, whether it's Abraham Lincoln or Martin Luther King Jr., the very act of trying to extinguish the future by eliminating the person who predicted it is the very thing that makes that future possible. In every single instance, when you eliminate the person who predicted it, it brings it about. And this brings me back to Bob Dylan on May 17th, 1966. Now that evening, when Judas, well, when Judas, yes, (laughs) when Butler calls Dylan Judas, what I find to be so striking about that particular event is that it has some similarities to when Jesus is on trial. Jesus, he's on trial Right? And they're trying to get him crucified, and these people who were so for him originally have turned against him, right? And Dylan, he's giving this concert, and these people who were with him during the first set, what happens during the second set? They turn against him because they do not want to hear about the vision that Dylan has for the future of rock. And so when Keith Butler calls Dylan Judas, what I find to be so striking about that is that actually he's referring to himself because Butler is the one who is unwilling to hear what Dylan has to say about the future of rock. And what happens that night when Dylan is crucified by that crowd for doing something that they didn't, didn't, that they didn't like? Well, what happens? It opens the door to this entirely new era of music. By fighting the future... It's what makes it possible. You see, I think that when we are fearful of what the future holds, that is when we are in danger of becoming like Judas. And let's be honest, most of us are afraid of what the future holds. It doesn't matter what stage of life you are in, the future represents uncertainty. And uncertainty raises our anxiety. It doesn't matter whether you're in elementary school going in, in elementary school and you're going into middle school. You know what? That's a really scary experience. If you're in high school, transitioning to college, 
can be a very stressful time. Whether it's a new job, a new relationship, moving to a new location, a new child, a new illness, a new death in the family. Life never seems to give us a break from the unknown. And our instinct in situations where the future seems uncertain is to hold on to what we know. We will fight to keep what we have and declare anyone who stands in our way to be an enemy. But I believe that the moment that you feel life should remain as it is, that it should not change, that the future should be a mirror image of the present, that is the moment when you allow your fear of the unknown to rule your life. I can tell you that for myself, the moments of greatest uncertainty in my life have been where I have grown the most in my faith. You all know from listening to me preach for the last year and a half, I'm a very rational, logical person. Faith is not something that comes very easily to me at all. And I tend to sympathize with Judas. I'm a lot like him. When the future feels uncertain, I want to control things. I want to make sure the situation turns out the way I want it to turn out. And I'll even do that to the point where, like Judas, I'll hurt people to get my way. But what I've realized is that in those instances where I'm trying to control things, that the world has a way of working around my desire for control. And so what I have come to embrace is this notion that I really have no control over the future. I let go of that, and I have to trust that God is going to place me where I'm supposed to be. Now when I say that, You have to trust God to place you where you're supposed to be. I don't mean to intend that that means everything is going to work out great for you. There are lots of people who trust God who have horrible things happen to them in their lives. It makes me so angry when I hear a pastor get up and sit there and say, you know what, if you just trust God, everything's going to be okay. That is patently untrue. The the disciples, Jesus' disciples, they all trusted God. And what happened to them? Every single one of them met a horrible end. That said, I really do believe that if you trust God, you're going to see more clearly where you're supposed to be. So, Joseph, he was supposed to be in Egypt to store up grain. Jesus, he was supposed to be in Jerusalem so that he could be crucified. Abraham Lincoln, he was supposed to be president so that he could free the slaves. Martin Luther King Jr., he was supposed to be a pastor so he could lead the civil rights movement. And you, you have something important that you are supposed to do in this world. Maybe it's being a listening ear to a stranger. Maybe it's being a good parent to your children. Maybe it's playing beautiful music for those who are downtrodden. Maybe it's giving words of hope to those who are hopeless. Maybe it's showing forgiveness to those who have wronged you. Whatever it is, God has a role for you. And if you are willing to embrace the uncertainty of life and not run from it, then I guarantee you, you're going to do some amazing things in this world. Some things that are very, very important. And so as I end today, May you have the strength to embrace the uncertainty of life. May you have the ability to let go of a future over which you have no control. But most importantly, may God give you the faith to believe and trust that God is going to place you where you're supposed to be. All of us have a role to play. The question is, are you going to fight the future or are you going to help to make it better? Amen. must a man walk down
Yes, and how many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? Yes, how many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever banned? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Yes, how many years can a mountain exist before it's washed to the sea? Yes, how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, how many times can a man turn his head Pretending he just doesn't see The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind The answer is blowing in the wind Yes, how many times must a man look up before he can see the sky Yes, how many ears must one man have Before he can hear people cry Yes, how many deaths will it take Till he knows that too many people have died the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Amen. It does take us back a few years, doesn't it? Now is our time to come before our Lord in prayer. As we do, I'd like to lift up those who need special prayers this week. I ask for prayers for Hugh Field and Richard Thorpe, both who are hospitalized this week. And then our sympathy to Juanita Reinhardt on the death of her brother, Ted Wynn Bingler. He died on December 4th. And you'll remember she lost her sister this same year a few months ago. Also keep the Munns family in prayer. As we do our prayer today, it's a responsive prayer, so please turn to your bulletin so you can follow along with me. Sisters and brothers in Christ, for the sake of the world that God so loves, let us pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for peace in every nation, that people will turn their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, and study war no more. Pray for the peace of the church. We pray for peace in Christ's body. Put an end to fear and fighting, and help us to proclaim in word and action the good news of salvation to all. Pray for the peace of this community. We pray for peace in this place, for safety in our homes and streets, for the prosperity of our neighbors, for the health of family and friends. God of the future, make us ready for the coming of your reign, when you will bring everlasting peace and renew the face of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. As we come to the time of sharing our gifts, I'd like to remind you that we are still accepting pledges for the year 2015. And if you haven't committed yet to the life of this church and what we will do in the year ahead, I ask you to consider putting forth your pledge. Come now with gratitude and joy. Bring the works of your hands and the gifts of your lives as an offering of praise. We will now receive our offering.
But now as you go out from here, may God give you the strength and the faith to believe that God is going to place you where you're supposed to be. Because, remember, you can fight the future or you can help to make it better. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day, now, and forevermore. Amen.